On today's episode of Biblical Genetics, I've come to an old graveyard because I want to talk about something very important, in fact, something deadly, and that is pandemics. Right now, we are laboring under coronavirus. It is a disaster for the world economy, disaster for a lot of people's health. With all this debate about masks and, and hydroxychloroquine and social distancing and rights and responsibilities of the government and the people, I and mean, it's just a big, ugly mess. But I don't want to talk about coronavirus. I want to go back 100 years. The H1N1 virus is the centerpiece of a very critical piece of science that my colleagues and I were able to do. We had this idea. It wasn't my idea. It was an idea of a man named John Sanford. He wrote a book called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. Genetic entropy is simple. It's the idea that mutations accumulate in the genome like rust accumulates in a car. You can change the tires on the car, but eventually rust will destroy it. Just like in genetics, natural selection might be able to remove a mutation or two, especially the really bad ones, but it can't take out the weak ones, the ones that hardly do anything. They're still bad, but only a little bit bad. It's like if you had a, a textbook and you're studying this textbook to pass a class. And let's say that there's a couple of spelling errors in that textbook. Well, clearly you could still pass the class, but what if there's lots of spelling errors, lots of mistakes, pages missing, things torn? You're going to fail. And that's how this works. Pass or fail is life and death in, in evolution. But in genetics, nearly neutral mutations build up over time until organisms should go extinct. At least that's the theory in the genetic entropy book. Well, following the publication of the book, Sanford and colleagues got together, computer scientists and other scientists, and they wrote a computer program at the time, and it might still be true today. It was the most sophisticated evolutionary modeling program ever written. And it was written by creationists, interestingly. And this program was designed to directly test evolutionary theory according to evolutionary theory, using evolutionary parameters and everything else. And what they showed time and time again, case after case, publication after publication, evolutionary theory actually doesn't work. Yeah, selection works. Sure, great. Selection can focus on a couple of important mutations, but while they're doing that, the rest of the genome is still falling apart. We needed a real live situation, a real test in, in living things. But back when we did the study, this was 2011, 2012, and we didn't have enough data. There's a lot of data for humans, tons and tons of genetic data for humans alive today, not historically. We needed to see genetic changes over time. And that's when we found the Influenza Research Database. It turns out that there were thousands of influenza genomes that were deposited into this database, and they went back all the way to 1918. This is amazing. Well, what happened was there was a woman who died in Alaska in 1918 of the flu, and they buried her body in permafrost. So her body was essentially frozen for over 100 years. Well, they exhumed the body, they sampled some tissue, and they resequenced the initial H1N1. Now, probably not the initials. This is the second or third wave. It wasn't the first wave in 1917 that shut down the war almost. In fact, we call that the Spanish flu. And the reason we call it the Spanish flu was because Spain wasn't at war. Their newspapers weren't censored. The Axis and the Allies, they didn't want newspapers saying that so many th hundreds of thousands of their soldiers were sick and dying. Spain could do it. And therefore, we call it the Spanish flu. Now, interestingly, the origin of H1N1 might be in China. A historian very recently published a paper, and he said that there were thousands of Chinese workers in France during World War I. The Allies had gone to China and recruited a bunch of people in the middle of a pneumonia outbreak. Well, lots of the Chinese workers died on the ship going to Canada. Lots more died on the trains going across Canada. More died on the ship going across the Atlantic, and they kept dying when they were in France. It was really bad. So if that's true, we might actually have an, a, a source for this virus that plagued the world. I mean, you got to understand, when they were talking about World War I, you talk about how many people died per minute. Masses of men jumping out the trenches, running across no man's land, and being mowed down. But more people died of H1N1 than died of bullets, or even disease, during the war. Whoa, this is bad stuff. Well, it's been around ever since, sort of, because it actually went extinct in 1957. Yep, it did. It was gone from the world. It reappeared in 1976, strangely, but the strain that reappeared was identical to strains floating around in Scandinavia in about 1952 or 1953, and it appeared in northern China. 
Well, the Russian uh, agency involved in this, they admitted that they had opened up an old sample stored in the freezer and the influenza virus got out again. Now, why it appeared in Northern China, I don't know. We don't talk about that espionage stuff. That's all conspiracy theory stuff. No, but all we know is it was gone in 1957. It came back in 1976 and the mutations kept on building up because what we were able to do, and this is the cool thing. This is where genetic entropy actually hits the real world. What we did is we compared every sequence in the database to the original 1918 strain and simply counted up the number of differences. In other words, the mutations that had accumulated over time and they went up, but it was weird because they split. There was a lower line and an upper line. The upper line was lined up with, with the, the original 1918 and the lower line was off. Oh, what that was, that was the strain that was frozen and got reintroduced. When it was reintroduced, it had fewer mutations because it had been in the freezer from 1957 to 1976. But also the upper line, none of those infected humans, very few, I should say. That was a swine flu, the H1N1 that infects pigs. It's been in pigs ever since, at least 1917. They have their own strain. It's genetically distinct from the ones that was typically infecting humans. Now, every once in a while, one of the swine ones would infect a human, but never went pandemic. It just would just die out right there. So we found those in the database. Oh, this is a pig one in a human. Erase that, put it all together. And what we saw was a perfectly straight line. Tightest line I've ever seen in my scientific career. But it's proving at least for H1N1 over this time period, that mutation accumulation was linear. And when you look at the number of mutations per year, you look at the type of mutations. And when you look at how much of the genome changed, about 12 or 13 percent of that genome had randomly mutated. Yes, it was random. We actually did some other tests to show that just this random changes. 12 to 13 percent mutated at random and it went extinct again in 2009. Do you remember the 2009-2010 swine flu outbreak? Remember how big deal that was? That was huge. I mean, everyone was talking about it. Here it comes. We're all going to die. All these people are going to die. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. Then it just dropped out of the news cycle. Other news stories picked up and people just forgot about it. One reason for that was uh, not a lot of people were dying. It wasn't as bad as people thought. It had picked up a few fresh DNA sequences from a bird version of, it, of a influenza virus and it introduced itself into the pig H1N1 and that jumped to people and we were really concerned and it was a legitimate concern. We did not know how bad it was going to be. Just like with coronavirus, we did not know how bad it was going to be six months ago. It was a massive threat. So here we have the bird version or the swine bird version. We call it um, the swine flu 2009, 2010. And in early 2010, the human H1N1 virus went extinct for the second time. Wow. Mutations are not filtered out by natural selection. You have mutations that haven't been filtered out by natural selection. You have mutations that you're going to pass to your kids and they'll pass to their kids and they'll pass to their kids. And every generation, more and more mutations are building up. And there are too many to select away because if you have got a hundred mutations, you can't die a hundred times over. These are very, very minor things, little teeny spelling errors here and there, just taking an edge off of our perfection. It's a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less over time. And one day humanity is going to have a massive problem because we will have accumulated so many mutations that no matter what happens, we're going to die young. People are going to find it impossible to find a spouse with whom they can have children. It, it, there's all the sorts of uh, debilitating genetic diseases that will keep on coming up. Now, what's saving us right now is that there are over 7 billion of us. The exponential population growth over the last several centuries to several thousand years, that is actually a wonderful thing for humanity because that means that the rare mutations stay rare. If our population ever crashes down, the level of inbreeding could quite possibly drive us to extinction very quickly. Now, I bet if I walked around this old cemetery that I would find some markers that say 1917 or 1918. I'm pretty certain there's people buried right here that died of the Spanish flu over 100 years ago. Just like today, we saw a spike in the mortality statistics in the modern times because of coronavirus. You got to understand that viruses are a serious big deal. 
And even if coronavirus was not nearly as deadly as we thought, that doesn't mean the next one won't be. We do have to remain vigilant and we do have to use the best science that we can use to address the problems and the threats as they come up. I'm just telling you the way it is. I'm always worried about the next one. And the people who study these things are terrified because pandemics have happened before. Look at the bubonic plague, the plague of Justinian, all sorts of plagues across the world at different times. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people have died. We know that diseases have jumped from animals to people before. Tuberculosis killed my great grandfather, two of my great uncles, probably two of my great aunts, but they were too young. I don't know what they died of. They both died before they were five. Tuberculosis probably came from cows, but those are zoonotic diseases, diseases that go from one species to another. And there are multiple zoonotic diseases that currently infect people. It's going to happen again. In fact, I'm kind of guessing the first time one of the coronaviruses that causes the common cold jumped to people, that it was really bad and it killed millions of people. If there were millions of people around at the time, it killed lots of people, shall we say. But then it weakened to the point where now it's just the cold. So we don't know what coronavirus is going to do. Maybe it's going to go kaput. It doesn't look like it. There's too many of cases right now. But hopefully it will weaken. The thing is, though, the weakening doesn't happen overnight. It takes years for the mutations to build up to the point where things go extinct. Cemeteries are no fun. Considering the fact that every single grave in this place was associated with a whole lot of tears, broken dreams, shattered families. Death will come to us all. There's nothing we can do about it, pandemic or not. So if you think you're comfortable in your life, maybe you should reconsider that. If you're not comfortable in your life, consider the words of Jesus Christ. This is John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So in the end, COVID-19 might kill us. H1N1 might kill us. Ebola, HIV, whatever. We're going to die of something. Maybe we get hit by a bus or eaten by a bear. I mean, whatever. We're going to die. But that's not the end because Jesus Christ promised that he's going to come back to this earth. And when he does, we're going to be resurrected from the grave and we're going to be sent to one place or another. As for me, I believe that I'm going to be in, in heaven with Jesus Christ because that's what he promised. Now, if you're not certain about that, pick up a Bible and start reading. In fact, I would recommend read the Gospel of John. It's a great starting point for explaining Christian theology, Christian history, Christian philosophy, what we believe and why we believe it. Now, John was a direct eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He was one of his disciples. He wasn't like a follower like Luke. He was a direct disciple of Jesus Christ, and he wrote down some unbelievably cool things. Now, if you don't have a copy of the Bible, BibleGateway.com is right there. Easy to find. Show notes. Or ask to borrow a Bible from someone. Go find a Christian and ask them what they believe and why. Go find a pastor and see if he can tell you what he believes and why. That'll be fun. Don't give up. There is hope and there is peace through faith in Jesus Christ.